Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the award-winning Texas history podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise. Thank you for tuning in today for a little bit of Texas history. Today, we're going to continue the Texas Revolution site, historic site series that I began a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to continue it with a historic site that, though it doesn't get a lot of press, was actually the third historic Texas Revolution site acquired by the state of Texas after the two obvious ones, the Alamo and San Jacinto, and that is the Fannin Battleground State Historic Site. Now, this is the place where James Fannin and the ill-fated men in Presidio La Bahia, when they attempted to go to Victoria, they stopped to feed their animals in an open area just east of the Presidio. And they didn't understand how close the Mexican army was to them. They got trapped, they got surrounded, and they eventually surrendered, leading directly to the massacre at Goliad. In this episode, I sit down with Fannin Battleground site manager Brian McCauley, who we heard previously. He also manages the San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site. And we talk about the third historic Texas Revolution site acquired by the state of Texas, the Fannin Battleground. Enjoy the interview. Brian, thanks again for being on Wise About Texas for your second appearance. Thanks. Um, you mentioned in the first interview that the listeners hopefully have already heard about San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site that you're also in charge of the Fannin Battleground. Tell, her, tell us what the Fannin Battleground is and where it is. Sure. So the Fannin Battleground is in the tiny town of Fannin, Texas, in Goliad County. And uh, it very much is an offshoot of the Goliad story that most Texas history lovers already know, where the Goliad massacre took place in the Presidio La Bahia uh, in Goliad. So it's about 10 miles from that fortress. And this is not happenstance at all. Um, Many of us on the Texas Revolution history side sometimes uh, speculate in in the alternate history universe the battle site at Fannin, which is uh, reflective of the Coletto Creek battle it's often referred to as, is really an historic site that in some ways shouldn't exist. Um, unfortunately, James Fannin found himself in a very difficult situation that was compounded by his own read of politics, his own read of military scouting, and you know, uh, in a perfect world, had the military strategy played out better, Fannin likely would have defended the Presidio at Goliad in, a, in an event that would have looked a lot like the Alamo with better, better cards in his hand of having a smaller fort and more men. So who knows how things would have gone had he read that correctly. But in trying to evacuate and retreat to Victoria as late as he did, and he truly seems to have been confused about the size of the Mexican force that was upon him at that time, Fannin and his men managed to get captured out on an open plain near Coleto Creek, which is between Goliad and Victoria and find themselves in a pretty desperate situation, surrounded first by Mexican cavalry that have ridden up on them, uh, followed by infantry, and then ultimately on the second day of the battle there by artillery. And at that point, he's surrounded, he's in a bit of a depression uh, in the geographic landscape, and the Mexican army can just lob shells at him for as long as they are inclined to do so. And so he's forced into a very difficult military situation. Most Texans and visitors to Texas who go to Goliad County are making a beeline for the Presidio, and that's great. That's a really important bookend of this story. It's really the centerpiece to the story. But uh, for the few that find their way to Fannin, they're going to discover one of the oldest state historic sites. So Fannin and Gonzalez were both acquired in 1913 and were the third and fourth sites, respectively, after San Jacinto and the Alamo had been, uh, had been owned, had been taken on by the state of Texas. So it's an important early site. People recognized the uniqueness of it being a battleground site and location. Uh, starting as early as 1915-1916, there were efforts to create a commemorative experience there. And interestingly, at least as I've dealt with Fannin, the community, um, going all the way back to that time, has celebrated the victory at San Jacinto as a way to think about the Texas Revolution story. So it's odd that we manage a site where some men died and were buried out there and where Fannin put up his his final military stand before being marched back as prisoners to the Presidio and Goliad. And the, the local community doesn't necessarily celebrate those dates. That's not what they commemorate. 
they commemorate the ultimate victory in Texas independence, which is a, a nice spin, I think, to put on the story. There are some relatively modern buildings that were added as part of the commemorative effort. There's a picnic pavilion, there's a bandstand building. Our agency in the last decade has opened up a new exhibit space inside the bandstand. And we continue to do a little bit of archeological exploration there. Um, there was nothing at the town of Fannin at the time of the battle. So there's no, there's no exploration of you know, who was living there, who were the settlers, what did the town look like. There was no town. Um, that emerged later uh, through some of the farming community that's centered in that area. So archeologically, we can do some pretty clear look at what might have happened in the battlefield, and we have a little insight into that. Um, and then from a commemorative standpoint, we're looking for ways to better share and celebrate the story. I, I do believe our agency feels like maybe in the next decade, coming up with a way to reinterpret it as a battleground would be a great outcome. Um, it's a small property. The commemorative components, unfortunately, impact what we can do with it as a battleground, but I think that'd be part of our interest, is coming up with ways to better help visitors understand where Fannin's men were, what were they experiencing as the Mexican army came up and encircled them and, and were running uh, attacks against his defensive square right there at the front entrance to the, to the facility. So I think you'll see some of that take place over time. So that prompts this question, how much, so the story of course, uh, so the listeners know, is Fannin finally decides to leave Presidio La Bahia and, and has a bunch of logistical trouble traveling through the mud with the cannons, all that right. kind of stuff, and decides to stop on an open plane. And we don't have, we, we can discuss whether that was a wise move or not. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> his men beseeched him not to do that. Correct. He did it anyway, formed a defensive square and, and was attacked and eventually surrendered. How big was that space in 1836, if you know, sure. and how much of it is part of the historic site do we think now? So uh, you're absolutely right, and, and no one wants to speak ill of, of the deceased or people that we envision as part of this heroic Texas story, but Fannin is a very complicated figure for a lot of reasons, and he clearly is making some poorly informed, if not outright bad decisions, unfortunately, that lead to the ending uh, that he and his men experienced. So uh, there were sort of two things. They evacuated the Presidio in the middle of a foggy morning, and they seemingly get about a two-hour head start without realizing that the Mexican army was frighteningly close to being ready to start laying siege to the Presidio. So they're, they're in the front yard waiting to start uh, coming, uh, attacking the fort. And so Fannin slips out, and the Mexican army is confused initially. They can't imagine why these guys just left the cozy confines of this fort and are out somewhere on the open plain, but they know they can't be far away. So they get started about two hours behind the Fannin's men as they retreat to Victoria. And as you note, uh, he dumps a cannon into the river there on the way out of town. They have to fish it out. And then when they get to this area near Coletto Creek, one of his men says, the guys handling the oxen team that are pulling a lot of their supplies forgot to stake the oxen out and get them fed last night. So their, their beasts of burden are becoming ornery. And they decide to stake them and let them feed, and that becomes the second lost hour. And then as they're trying to get back and start moving, they can see Coletto Creek about a mile away from where they are. And military historians who have processed this in the aftermath of the last almost 200 years would say, Fannin should have made a beeline for Coletto Creek and been following that creek in his route to Victoria just to provide himself with some cover so that if he got into a bind, he'd have some opportunities there. And I think that poor decision stems from him totally just not understanding how much of the Mexican force was as close to him as it was. So even though he knew there were scouts nearby for the Mexican army, he seemingly thought there weren't enough of them that he could get into a bind. And so he makes these sort of bad decisions on top of bad decisions. Um, Probably where Fannin comes out best when you look at this story is his panicked response, his reaction to being attacked and being caught, where he does form a, a very strong defensive square, which to your question sits right near, as best we can tell archeologically, right near the front entrance to the gate. So as you pull into Fannin to the battleground site, you make a left-hand turn, most of you coming from uh, US 59. Right as you enter the gate, just to your right is where the square was located. Unfortunately, it has been bisected by the farm to market road that goes through there. So that road was installed at a time when we didn't have archeologists manning construction sites and would have been aware of that sort of thing. So we know there was some impact to it. There's been enough archeology span left that we've been able to find significant evidence of Mexican bullets being fired into this concentrated area. 
There also was some commemorative efforts that go back to the early 20th century when a farmer who was there allowed one of the survivors of the Goliad massacre to come back and put a pile of rocks up. Actually, I think it was in the late 19th century, uh, 1890s. And he was marking where he believed the defensive square to be. And archaeology would seem to bear that out. The rocks were replaced with a, a tall gin screw that was drilled into the ground there. And there's some pictures of that being installed in the 19 teens. And so that's the commemorative that's on the location today that you would see when you come out. Certainly so, a unique monument among monuments. It is, it is. There's a great picture of one of the farmhands up on top of the gin screw sitting on it after they'd put it in place back from, uh, back from the good old days. In terms of size, we think the square was probably somewhere approaching 100 feet on the long sides and a little shorter. It wasn't a, it wasn't a true square. It was a little more rectangular uh, than, than a square would suggest. Um, but a four-sided um, defensive positioning, he had cannons that he placed on the corners, and he was able to repel most of the cavalry and um, infantry raids that were being thrown at him during the first day of, of battle once the Mexican army had caught his men. As I said earlier, the artillery really became the game changer. By the time Mexican cannon could come up and stay far enough away that they were out of the fire field for Fannin's guns, and then they could just lob grenades into this very tight square where all the men were. So it was, it was a little bit like uh, uh, shooting fish in a barrel at that point. So Fannin found himself in a big bind. Well, what uh, you mentioned earlier, reinterpreting or, or doing more to interpret the place as a battleground. What are there plans in place for that, or is that in the thinking stages? Where are we? It's still in the thinking stages right now, and one of the challenges will be not just figuring out how to do it, but figuring out how to fund it, and, and that'll be one of the things we'll have to, to navigate going forward. But one of the resources that most of us involved with Fannin recognized early on, uh, in the early 20th century, there was a water tank that has a large um, a foundational platform that's elevated near some of the commemorative pieces, and it's a large a uh, circular concrete pad, essentially, that's still there in the landscape. And it gives you, as a visitor, the perspective of height. You can get up on this thing and kind of see out over the landscape of the battleground to some degree, which in and of itself creates an accessibility issue we haven't solved yet. How do you get someone who's mobility impaired or in a wheelchair up to the top of this thing? We'll have to think that through. But the idea is you could be on this piece looking out over the battlefield. It's, it's basically on the opposite side of the commemorative site from where the defensive square was. You're on the back side of the property as opposed to the entrance gate. And we're imagining we could put some markers out in the landscape that mark certain things, where we think some of the cannon staging was done during the defensive square, for instance. And you could do that maybe with a, a, a thin sculptural piece. There's a lot of stainless steel sculpture and things that are thin sculptural representations, but do something that shows where the cannon may have been, at least uh, on that half of the square that's not lost to the roadway. And then, mark places where we presume, I don't know that we'll ever truly be able to figure out where the cavalry and infantry raids would have, would have come from as they have swept in on the men as they were trying to defend themselves there. So I think there's a way we can do it. Um, there's a commemorative circle drive that was added that is kind of right in the middle of how we'd like to manage this. So there are some, there's some memorial elements that we'll have to navigate and thinking through how we incorporate that battleground site. But I think visitors would get a real charge. We've even thought that pad, if we could find the funding and the vision for it, you could paint a walk surface map. We did some of this in, in planning for the museum I work at at San Felipe, where you could create a map of the battleground, much like we use in one of our exhibit pieces, but have it large enough that as a visitor you could be standing on the surface and kind of walk it and put yourself in the perspective of where the cavalry would be coming at Fannin and that sort of thing. So that may be a unique way to help people process what they see and try to look at it through the filter of history. Well, I hope you get that done sooner rather than later. Yeah. What, currently, um, what should people do when they want to go visit this battleground? What, what should they be thinking about? How should they best experience it? Well, the good news is, um, right now, anyone that's chasing the Fannin story is undoubtedly going to the Presidio La Bahia. And unless you're coming up from the coast, unless you're coming from Corpus Christi or somewhere down in that area, you're going to drive right past Fannin on 59 if you're coming from the north or coming from the east. So it's an easy get to. Uh, most of our visitors find it rewarding just because they're not as familiar with the site and it's a nice little place to stop. Uh, I've been amazed over the last decade how often I go there in the springtime as we're chasing this revolution story and I'll find individual travelers or families that have put their own itinerary together and a frequent mix for Fannin 
is best barbecue joints in Texas and Texas Revolution sites because there happens to be a local barbecue joint that often makes Texas Monthly's list of acclaimed restaurants and so it's a place called McMillan's. So if you're there at the right time of day, what a great excuse to get off and have some ribs and go see right. some Texas history. Um, the facility is a quick visit. It does have picnic facilities, so do, people do come out and plan for that, make that part of their stop if they want to bring their family and have a quick sandwich while they explore the history. The exhibit space itself is a relatively quick visit, but uh, I tend to find most of our visitors who know the story when they get down there, they tend to treat it pretty somberly, which I think is appropriate and respectful. Um, there were men fighting with Fannin who died and were buried where they fell. Um, one of the aspects of Fannin's story, because this battle crossed a nighttime component into a second day. Fannin could have made the decision with his healthy men to run for the creek under the cover of darkness. And so the, the last fateful decision that Fannin made was to not abandon his wounded. And there were many after that first day's battle. So rather than leave those men to, to almost a sure fate of death, they all stayed together and ended up sharing that fate functionally, but for the few men that survived the Goliad massacre. Well, that's a great tribute to Texas heroism, I think. And in an otherwise terrible situation. Brian, thank you so much for the work you do for Texas history, and thanks especially for joining us again on Wise About Texas. Great to be with you, Kim. Thanks. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. You can get to the Fannin Battleground State Historic Site. The actual address is 734 FM 2506 Fannin, Texas. It's on 59, just US 59, just east of uh, Goliad, Texas. You'll see the sign for the town of Fannin, and there'll be signs either direction you're going that point you toward the Fannin Battleground, and it's just a mile or two down the road uh, to the south of town. Uh, well worth a stop, very historic spot, and a very important spot in Texas history. And of course, while you're in the area, you'll want to visit Presidio La Bahia, which will be the next episode in this series featuring the Texas Revolution sites. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. I hope that uh, everyone's doing well. This is being released in April 2020 during the coronavirus pandemic. But we seem to have changed the tone. The state parks are going to reopen as of April 20th. And so you'll have a chance to go see all these sites, hopefully uh, either shortly after uh, you listen to this episode or, or right when you are listening to the episode. Go find the Wise About Texas Facebook page, like it, and share it. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. I wanted everyone to stay safe and go do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.